All right, so I wanted to make a little video on some ACLS review and then what we learned in diagnostics, which is going to be an EKG review. Before I do this, just know that I am not qualified to teach ACLS by any means. So if somehow you found this video and you're trying to learn ACLS like legit, please don't watch this. This is just, I'm going over my notes. I'm ACLS certified as like a practitioner, um, but I'm basically just going over my notes, kind of looking at it at it at like a slightly different way. Um, so just take all of this with a with a grain of salt and always, you know, check your uh, local protocols and stuff before you save lives. I don't know what I'm saying. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go right into it. All right. So when we talked about like I always thought this term cardioversion was interesting because it can mean a couple of different things. At the end of the day, what are we doing? We're giving the heart like a new rhythm, or at least we're attempting to, but there's different ways we can do that. So there's med medical cardioversion, which is using an IV push of a medication um, like amio or lidocaine. There's synchronized electrical cardioversion. So this is when you're like, when you hear the term, um, it's not really pacing, but it's like somebody, somebody's in AFib, they're stable, but they're like electively being cardioverted because they want to try to get out of AFib. It's synchronized, right? You're setting it to a specific uh, amps or joules or whatever. Um, then there's unsynchronized electrical cardioversion, also known as defibrillation. So I think knowing the difference between those two, synchronized is like everybody in the room is like on board. It's kind of a little bit more calm. This is on purpose. Unsynchronized is we're trying to get somebody out of, you know, pulseless VTAC or, or VFib, you know, turn it all the way up, shock. And then there's transcutaneous pacing, which is going to be used for like symptomatic bradycardia. It's going to be used for uh, like different heart blocks where you're putting the same pads on somebody, um, but you're not like shocking them once. You're actually like continuously pacing them, which can actually be pretty painful. So that's kind of like the vocabulary here. There's different scenarios. So the one that you might encounter is just pulseless electrical activity. What does this mean? Basically, any rhythm can be on the monitor. It could be VTAC, it could be VFib, it could be, um, well, that's actually not a great example, but it could be, um, you know, sinus rhythm, for example. And you're like, oh, that's great. Well, my patient's kind of not responding. They don't have a pulse. So that's what PEA is. It's a potentially, you know, like life-sustaining rhythm. There's electrical activity happening, but the heart, the actual contractions are too weak to actually move blood. So you don't have a pulse. All right. You're going to treat this um, in terms of a code as just cycling between uh, CPR and then epinephrine, one milligram of epinephrine. So there's no cardioversion here at all, whether that's chemical or electrical, it's just epi, CPR, and uh, and hope for the best. Just make sure that's what I have here. Okay. Asystole is going to be uh, it's going to be treated exactly the same way, just standard CPR and then and then epinephrine as well. So again, no cardioversion. Um, all right, then we get into like what I call kind of like the classic code. So there's these two rhythms. There's pulseless VTAC and there's VFib, and these are totally shockable, and that's going to be really important. That's that's going to change uh, the algorithm. To begin, it, it's kind of the same as PEA and asystole. However, you're going to shock right away. VFib, it's very, very important. I mean, for both of these, but it's so important to uh, to defibrillate before like anything else. So that's going to be your priority. You know, do your pulse check right back on the chest, do your CPR, airway, all that stuff. And then you're going to cycle kind of between, you're going to do epinephrine, um, and then you're going to do 300 of amiodarone, 300, because this is an unstable situation. Your patient doesn't have a pulse. And then you're going to do epi. And then the next cycle is not going to be anything because amio is every like 15 minutes. Um, however, the next dose of amiodarone, even though the patient is still unstable, is going to be 150. Okay. So that's kind of like the classic code. Then we get into what I think is actually the most complex part of ACLS. And that's when your patient has a pulse. So scenario five kind of is VTAC, but with a pulse. So when you look at things like this, it's pulseless VTAC. Well, that's there for a reason. You know, you can't have VFib with a, 
with a pulse, but VTAC, you can. So when your patient has VTAC and they have a pulse, there's two buckets that you could potentially be in, stable or unstable. And really the big definition of that is blood pressure. I forget what like the map is for that. Um, not terribly important. Actually, that's, it's probably is pretty important. I just don't have that here. I have it somewhere. It's going to be impossible to find. Uh, it's, it's fine. I'm not going to worry about it at the moment. But anyway, you know, and like unstable is like your patient's not responding. You know, if they're unstable, what you're going to do is a synchronized cardio version. Why is it synchronized and not unsynchronized? Because your patient has a pulse. Are they unstable? Is their blood pressure low? Yes. But you're still going to do synchronized cardio version. You're not going to ramp it all the way up. Okay. The other reason it's synchronized is because there is a pulse to synchronize to. That's the important thing. Unsynchronized, there's 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 no pulse. You know, VTAC, VFib are technically rhythms, but there's really no like QRS to kind of like sync it to, kind of. So for stable VTAC with a pulse, your patient has VTAC, they have a pulse, and they're stable, meaning their blood pressure is fine. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is you can consider adenosine. I feel like nobody ever talks about that. Really, the right answer is always going to be 150 of amiodarone. Why? Because your patient is stable. It's not an unstable dose, which would be 300. It's going to be stable, uh, and that's going to be amiodarone. All right, so 150 for amiodarone. This is what VTAC looks like. So just kind of know, know the difference between the two. Some vignettes, I think, might just say they're unstable or their blood pressure will be very low. Um, and you'll know, okay, that's going to be, you know, electrical cardioversion. If they're stable, it's going to be medical cardioversion. All right. Okay. So moving on to SVT. So supraventricular tachycardia. Again, if they're stable, their blood pressure is okay. The technical correct answer of what to do first is have them bear down, do vagal maneuvers, carotid massage. If that doesn't work, you break out the adenosine. You want to start with six. So versus amiodarone, where we're starting high with the 300 going to 150, this is the reverse. You don't want to overkill with adenosine because it stops the heart. So you're going to start with six milligrams. If that doesn't work, then you can try um, the 12 milligrams. I think you have to wait a minute, but don't quote me on that. Right. That's this whole like brown pants scenario. That's actually why I have this brown color because your patient will flatline and then you pray that they come back in sinus rhythm or you can see the underlying rhythm like AFib or something that's really causing this issue. All right. If that doesn't work, then you can rate control with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Okay. Um, yeah, whatever. Okay. And then unstable SVT, same thing as unstable VTAC. It's just going to be synchronized cardioversion. All right. So again, synchronized because they have a pulse, even though they're unstable, they have a pulse. We can synchronize that cardioversion. Okay. AFib whatever, use metoprolol. You can do synchronized cardioversion, kind of like what we talked about. Torsades, you actually treat just like pulseless VTAC and just like VFib. Um, you, you can try to shock it. You can do epi, you can do amiodarone. That's what I was told. So, um, and then you can give, actually, I think you give magnesium instead of amiodarone. See, this is why I'm not qualified to teach this and why I'm just going through my notes. All right, the last thing is bradycardia. So when you have symptomatic bradycardia, so again, they're like unresponsive, their blood pressure isn't great. This is when you're gonna use atropine. So don't confuse adenosine, which stops the heart, and atropine, which increases the rate of, of the heart. And this one is uh, 0.5 milligrams, some say one. 
if it doesn't work, don't keep doing it. Uh, you, and then, you know, you'll go to transcutaneous pacing or you'll actually put them on uh, like a presser. Okay, so that's that's it. I just wanted to go over that real quickly. And then, all right, so we're gonna talk about EKGs. This picture is probably the most valuable thing in terms of EKGs I've ever seen. I have always struggled with figuring out what leads coincide with what blood vessels and this instant, because even something like this doesn't help you there, but this, I absolutely love, especially with the circumflex. If you can see this left circumflex, it's kind of like you're playing Pac-Man. When you go off the bottom right of the screen, you appear on the, on the upper left. That's kind of what's happening here. So if you can picture V5 and V6 and one in AVL, which we know as the lateral leads, lateral V5, V6, high lateral uh, one in AVL, which you can see up on this picture, that's all circumflex. So it's kind of your two corners are forming your, your circumflex. Everything else on this right side is, and it's kind of like where the left circumflex is coming off is the left. And you can actually look at this picture anatomically. So anatomic right is gonna be on you know your viewer left and then, and then the opposite. So that can kind of help you as well. Like, all right, I'm actually looking at a person here and you can see that left is on this side and right is on that side. So this is all lad territory. So you have your septal leads, which are going to be V1 and V2. And then you have your uh, your anterior leads, which are going to be V3 and V4. So different leads, but they're all, you know, they're all placed right next to each other in terms of um, the actual stickers, the electrodes themselves. So that's all going to be the lad. So if you see... ST elevation in this whole section, including one in AVL, it's not going to be a LAD uh, block. It's actually going to be a left main blockage. Everything on the left is knocked out, including, including the circumflex. So keep that in mind. All right. Everything else is just the RCA. We don't really get into like the marginal um, coronary artery or anything. So what we call the inferior leads, two, three, and AVF, are going to be known as um, that's that's the RCA is what's is what's supplying those. And then there's ABR, which we really don't really don't talk about that much at all. Okay, so there's that. Yeah, if you memorize that, you you get so many questions right. Here's like another sort of slight way to look at this. I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. So know that sinus dysrhythmia, this can be really tricky to look up. I've seen this in the ER. It's a lot more obvious than this picture. This just looks like sinus rhythm. Um, but you can see these last two QRS complexes here are a little closer together. Um, so when you breathe in, the rate increases. When you breathe out, it kind of slows a little bit. And that's just complete. That's just normal. So inspiration inhibits the vagal tone. Uh, and that's why this is happening. Sinus arrest is just for whatever reason, uh, you just don't have a heartbeat. You want to, you know, for a, a few seconds. So you want to make sure this isn't like a heart block or something. So, you know, look at your PR inter intervals and, every, and your P waves and everything. So those are just like, hey, these are sinus rhythms, but something kind of weird's going on. All right, moving on to what's next? Atrial. Okay. So there's two, there's one called a little bigger. Okay. So now we're talking about atrial rhythms. Well, what is an atrial rhythm? You know, isn't everything in atrial rhythm because of the SA node? Yeah. But this is where there's like weirdness going on somewhere in the atria. There's some type of rogue pacemaker or the SA node is, is a little bit funky. That's when we're getting into these atrial rhythms. So the first one we talk about is called wandering atrial pacemaker. The big hallmark here is a rhythm defined by at least three different P waves. So if you see something that's like, all right, it kind of looks sinusy. Oh, but what is this? That's like barely a P wave. This is like a big P wave. They all look kind of different. If you have at least three that look kind of different, it's technically wandering atrial pacemaker. Okay. Now, if this gets faster, so just like the basic rate of the heart is 60 to 100, right? Um, once we get over 100, we graduate from WAP, from Wandering Atrial Pacemaker, and we go to MAT, which is now called Multifocal 
atrial tachycardia. I think this is the big one for um, like theophylline toxicity that always comes up with like asthma and COPD and stuff. So it's the same thing. Obviously it's faster. These even look like, um, these kind of look like PACs. Like it's a pretty crazy looking rhythm, but you know, try to find these P waves. Okay. There's one there. It's really close to the T. Okay. There's definitely P waves. It's not like AFib or anything, but yeah, they're all very, very different. So this is multifocal atrial tachycardia, and you would just have to make sure you're at a rate of a hundred or greater to distinguish between the two. I don't think you'll ever have both as like an option, but just know one is a little slower and one's a little faster. Uh, and the path here is just, there's uh, a, a rogue pacemaker site in the, in the atria. So it's still, you know, setting off, it's still sending to the AV node. It's still, you know, contracting the heart the way that it's intended. Um, but it's not the SA node. It's like, you know, SA node would like be these big P waves and these little ones are like these little rogue wannabe SA nodes. That's wandering atrial pacemaker. All right, so then each type of you know rhythm has its own premature beat. So this is a premature atrial contraction or a premature atrial complex or a PAC. And you're gonna see like, okay, a regular rhythm, here's our P wave, here's our QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, and then P, QRS. And then this, this looks like it, it came a little too quickly. If you see, you see, but you see the P wave, which means the, uh, you know, the beat is originating in the atria. That's how you know it's a PAC. And we'll look at the other premature beats as well. And what's important here versus a PJC, which we'll talk about in a second, is that the premature beat in a PAC has a viewable P wave. Yep. Yeah, that's actually exactly what I just said. Okay, so now we're moving on to A flutter. This is that kind of classic, you know, sawtooth pattern. This is that classic sawtooth pattern. And the thing here is that it's regular. It's AFib-ish. AFib is actually kind of like a faster version of this, but it's regular. You see there's like these, these three waves and then a QRS. These three waves, I think it's like technically these are two P waves because this is the T wave and then a QRS. It's irregular, but it's regular. All right, and you have these sawtooth waves. It's like the AV node is kind of like a goalie here. I'll just read this. In atrial flutter, there's a single irritable site in the atria that is initiating many electrical impulses at a rapid rate. So the single site is flustered or fluttered. Rather than the presence of normally appearing P waves, flutter or sawtooth waves, also known as F waves, are patterned or are present. And the single irritable site is so irritable, it's actually producing upwards of 300 beats per minute. You know, if you can imagine each one of these P waves giving like a QRS, yeah, that's pretty fast. However, the AV node becomes the gatekeeper. It's doing its job and it's like, okay, relax. You know, I'll let some of these through, but there's no way we're contracting the ventricles at 300 beats per minute. So if the AV node were a goalie in A flutter, it's like block, block, goal, block, block, goal. So block, block would be each like non-conductive P wave and goal would be, okay, P wave. And then we let the QRS through. That's kind of like the goal, okay? And then this is technically three to one. So I guess there's like not technically a T wave here. And this is like two to one. So just look at how many like bumps you have and call that three to one or two to one. Okay. If that gets out of control, then we move on to AFib. So with AFib, rather than a single flustered site like an A flutter, we have multiple ectopic foci within the atria blitzing the AV node. So multiple strikers on the poor AV node goalie. So with A flutter, the AV node can still act as a gatekeeper because there's just one striker trying to score a goal. That's why A flutter is a regular rhythm. But with AFib, there are multiple strikers and the AV node can't be goalie for all of them. So the AV node allows impulses to enter the conduction system at random, which is why AFib is irregularly irregular. So if the AV node were a goalie in AFib, it's like block, goal, block, 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 goal, block, block, goal, block, goal. It's random. So if you think of it in like that, um, 
like soccer analogy, that kind of helped me remember it. But a flutter and AFib, very, very closely related, you know, but one is irregular and one is regular. Okay. Supraventricular tachycardia is an atrial rhythm. It's not a ventricular rhythm. Remember, supra means above. So su I think it's not the greatest name. They should call this something else. But supraventricular tachycardia means above the ventricles. It should just be called like atrial tachycardia. Um, whatever. So with this one, there's an atrial ectopic foci that overrides the SA node completely and becomes the heart's primary pacemaker. The SA node is taken hostage. The AV node gatekeeper thing kind of just like disappears. SVT is very easy to spot. It just looks like this. You have this like one wave in the middle. Is it a T wave? Is it a P wave? Are they both kind of on top of each other? Not really sure, but you can't call these P waves. It's just a bump and then a QRS, a bump and then a QRS. So that's how you can see SVT. Wolf Parkinson White, is it, just know it's a delta wave. I don't think I've ever seen this like tested on, on pack rat or like anything. Wolf Parkinson White, whatever. It's, an, it's this like accessory pathway. Look, you could see like there's this weird, it's almost like somebody tried to make a detour all the way over here on the left side of the heart. And then it just kind of keeps going around and around, whatever. All right, moving on to ventricular rhythms. I call it junctional. Forgot, forgot these existed. Okay. A junctional rhythm is a rhythm that comes from the AV nodes. We were just talking about rhythms that come from the SA node. Now we're talking about not the, I'm sorry, not the SA node from the atria. Now we're going to the next section of the heart, right in the middle. We're talking about the AV junction. So there's something called a premature junctional contraction. So with this one, there's just an ectopic site in the AV junction that just fires and we fire off a QRS without a visible P wave as it's hidden in the QRS. Why this happens is because the QR is because the AV node is in the like center of the heart, it's firing down towards the ventricles and up towards the atria at the same time. So you can't visualize them separately on the EKG because they're happening at the same time. And we'll, and, and we'll see this in a second. This can be a little confusing to kind of wrap your head around. But if you look at something like this, you know, to kind of anchor yourself, you have like, okay, here's a beat, here's a beat. This looks like it came a little bit too quick. Like, here's a beat, here's a beat, here's a beat. This looks like it came slightly too quick. However, there's no P wave here. There's no notable P wave here. You're And you're getting a narrow QRS, which will be important in a second. Um, there's no P wave here. You're just getting a QRS out of nowhere. That's the hallmark for a, for a junctional rhythm. Once we talk about ventricular rhythms, I'm not going to go all the way up, but when you see things like V-fib and V-tac, the QRS is very wide because the electrical stimulus is coming from the ventricles, which takes a while to like travel up the heart. All right. PJCs, if they keep happening, um, or if you have a situation where the SA node fails to generate an impulse, so the SA node is completely knocked out, so we cannot conduct the heart between 60 and 100 anymore, the AV node takes over, and the AV node is like, all right, that's fine. I can still keep us at 40 to 60, nothing quite life-threatening yet, but I'm going to keep us at 40 to 60. And what happens in this case is that the AV node is firing up towards the P wave. Um, and because that electricity is traveling backwards, where normally it would go from SA node to AV node, you know, to Purkinje fibers, it's going from AV node upwards toward the SA node, toward the atria. And if the electricity is traveling backwards, the P wave is going to register below the isoelectric line. So that's why you have these upside down P waves here. So if you see the absence of P waves for a PJC or upside down P waves, that's all gonna be junctional territory, okay? P 
P waves are present, but they're upside down because they're originating in the AB node and traveling upward, the opposite of the normal flow in the atria. And that's because like the AV node has become the official pacemaker. I don't know exactly why you potentially couldn't see that with a PJC. I don't know why this one is technically so fast that the P wave is hidden here. And this one is upside down. I'm sure there's a reason and something I'm missing, but just know these are two hallmarks of like, just knowing this is junctional is is going to be good enough, right? But yeah, this is junctional escape. This is like, there's no upright P waves at all. AV node is, is in control, okay? Now remember, that's 40 to 60. If that goes faster to 60 to 100, so now the AV node is like, I can be as fast as the SA node. I can go 60 to 100. You're going to see this. Now, we get that same thing where the P waves are not visible. I think that's the thing. This is so slow. This is just a slower rate overall. So we see the dipped P waves. This PJC rhythm happens to be faster as like a baseline, which is why we're not seeing that. However, if we take the junctional escape rhythm, which is 40 to 60, and we accelerate it to 60 to 100, those P waves now move inside of the QRSs and, and we can't see them anymore. The really fascinating thing here is that this kind of looks like a regular AFib because it's a rhythm with an absence of P waves, but it's not because remember AFib is irregularly irregular. AFib doesn't look this clean, but you see a rhythm with an absence of P waves. Really the first thing you always think is AFib, but that's not the case. This is an accelerated junctional rhythm because it's 60 to 100. We can ramp this up one more level and we can go to junctional tachycardia. So the AV node itself can go full super saiyan here and churn out beats at a rate of 100 to 180. This is like so crazy looking. And actually the P wave actually moves to the right of the QRS. So I think technically the P wave is this dip here. It's still upside down because it's traveling backwards. So you kind of have this idea of upside down P wave before, upside down P wave in the middle, which technically would bring the height of the QRS down, if that makes sense, and then inverted P wave after. So junctional is pretty cool, but it's very obvious once you see something you're like, that's definitely junctional. Whew. Okay. I think I am going to take a bit of a break here. All right. So when we talk about the ventricular rhythms, remember what I talked about before where you have these wide QRS complexes. That's because the you know, impulse, it's not coming from the atria, it's coming from the ventricles. And it takes a while to come up those large ventricles and, you know, depolarize the entire heart. So when we talk about PVCs, remember I said each one of these kind of has its own premature beat. PVC is this big, ugly thing, very obvious to, to pick up on on strips. So unifocal, they're all the same multifocal are like, here's a big, ugly one. Here's a big, ugly one. The, you know, these are all kind of different. These are like technically like by Gemini, you know, here's your normal, your normal QRS. It's, it's, there's a P wave. It's coming from the atria, the SA node, but then you have these random things. So this is by Gemini. It's one of these, one of those, one of these, one of those. So these are PVCs. Um, if you get these that are sustained, they can go into, you can go into like these runs of VTAC or a salvo of VTAC. You can see that kind of here. So that's three PVCs in a row. Um, then you have, yeah, you have idioventricular rhythms. I actually saw this once um, in the ER. Really, really strange. Actually, I think it was more, no, yeah, it was definitely something like this. It was kind of something like this, pretty, pretty crazy to see, but it's basically just 
ventricular beats. Like these are just PVCs. They're just VCs, right? They're just ventricular complexes with nothing else going on. Um, and this is basically the SA notes gone, the AV notes gone. It's like the heart's last ditch effort, um, which is going to be between 20 and between 20 and 40, like the Purkinje fibers are taking over at this point. So that's what you'll see here, just ventricular beats. It's regular though, right? It's These are all the same. It's regular, like the Purkinje fibers are doing their job, but it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, so VTAC is just, again, it's like three or more PVCs. And then you just go into, you have all these just ventricular beats one after another. So see how wide, how wide these are. Um, this is a really weird one. It's called ventricular standstill. It's just P waves. So the SA node is functioning, but everything else is broken. It's basically the opposite of the ventricular escape rhythm where it's just the ventricles. This is just P waves. So pretty crazy, this ventricular standstill. Here's torsades, very classic. Give them magnesium, treat it like pulses VTAC or VFib. And then you have VFib, which can either be fine or can be coarse. And yeah, I mean, torsades, like you see how it's it's slants here and then comes up, slants here and comes up. It's almost like a bow tie. That's that like twisting of points. Coarse VFib can sort of look like that, but coarse VFib is... Look how chaotic this is. There's some rhyme and reason to what's going on here. These kind of look similar. Okay, now we're looking similar. Of course, VFI, there's no rhyme or reason to any of this. So, you know, you can potentially confuse those. They're treated the same in terms of like the code, except you're going to use magnesium for torsades. But anyway, here's all three of those premature complexes next to each other. So here's the PAC, you have the P waves the PJC with no P wave, and then the PVC, I mean, which, you know, just jump out at you. All right, um, heart blocks, I guess we can go over this very quickly. First degree block is just gonna be at a prolonged PR interval. Um, that should be greater than, greater than 0.2 uh, seconds, which is a whole big box, right? Because each one is 0.04, so five of those. So you can see how big this PR interval is here. That's going to be your first degree AV block, but it's regular, right? You do have a P wave for every QRS. It's regular. Everything is equally spaced. And uh, it's just your P wave is a little bit separated from your QRS. Okay. Moving on to second degree, which is Mobitz type one. This is that very classic, you know, normal looking P wave first degree-ish looking P wave. Well, this is so super far away. And then a whole beat is dropped. You know, it's longer, longer, longer drop. Now you're in Wanky Bach or whatever. It's irregular because you have those missed beats. All right. This is kind of a more sinusy looking rhythm. This one's like a little bit weirder. You have this like dipped like S wave going on. But, you know, look at the signal. Look at the signal in the noise. This technically, I think, is like the dropped beat, P wave extended. This, this one's like an every two, which is pretty interesting. So it's there, a little bit longer, gone. There, a little bit longer, gone. So these can, this can present in different ways. Mobitz type two, which is second degree AV block type two, is where you just have um, P waves that are not conducting. So, you know, you have the P wave QRS, P wave QRS, P wave QRS, and then P wave P wave, P wave, P wave QRS, P wave QRS. So that's that's what this looks like. But the you know the PR interval isn't uh, prolonged. It's still a normal PR interval when there's an accompanying QRS. Then you'll just have like these empty um, P waves. Now you want to make sure you can distinguish second degree AV block type two from third degree AV block. The good way to do that is. Third degree AV, AV block is regular. The distance between the QRS complexes, um, each QRS complex and the next one, and also the distance between the P waves are always going to be the same. This is where you do that kind of index card trick. In second degree, sure, these three QRS complexes are equal, 
but they're not equal between this one because you have all these missed beats. This is an irregular beat. This can't be third degree, okay? Over here, on the other hand, you have these QRS complexes um, that are equally spaced from each other. And then if you look at the P waves, these are also equally spaced with each other. The issue you can run into with third degree AV block is that P waves, since the, you know, the atria and the ventricles are doing their own thing, eventually they're, sometimes they could even line up, look at this P wave into a QRS, kind of looks kind of normal. And sometimes they can hide inside of each other. So if you look at this first one here, you have a P wave, you have a P wave. The next one should be around here. And it is, it's inside of this T wave, which is bringing our depolarization up above that isoelectric point. You have another P wave, you have another P wave. Then you have um, right after the T wave here, you have the immediate P wave. So third degree, once you get good at picking it up can, you know, becomes pretty easy. I've circled this too with the different P waves, you know, they're showing up just in weird spots in relation to like the QRS and the T wave, but they're regular. So that's third degree. Okay, heart block, I am running out of energy. 12 leads, we already talked about this. Knowing this picture is just so absolutely important. Look for like your ST depressions and stuff. Make sure you put the, the V1 and V2 on the in the fourth intercostal space. If there's one thing I've seen in working in an ER is that people like to go way up here in like the second intercostal space. Not correct. Put it down on the fourth. Look up V1, V2, V3 are, are very close to each other, you know? So if you see V1 and V2, like up near the clavicles, that's, that's not, that's not correct. Should be right above the nipple line. Everybody's anatomy is a little bit different, but you know, for a, like a lean male, like this guy, it's, see, it's V1 and V2 are right above the nipple line. That's like, a pet peeve. Yeah. There's like different types of STEMIs, whatever. Hypertrophy. Yeah. I mean, it's a thing. I, I don't put a lot of weight into this. I've never seen this come up on like a smarty pants question. I don't, I just don't care about it as much. You're going to see these bigger P waves for right atrial versus left atrial, whatever. You get this weird that for left ventricular hypertrophy, you get these increased like um, like R waves, right? Or S waves. Q R S. And then um you get this like S T depression in V5 and V6. So that's very hallmark for that. That's a strain pattern. So that's something that's good to know. Vesicular blocks, axis deviation. There's the whole like thumb up, thumb down thing. It's a lot of effort to learn this stuff. I think like in the grand scheme of things, it's it's kind of like low yield. Bundle branch blocks, an easy thing to do with this is they have these very characteristic like shark fin Q wide QRS complexes. It's not crazy wide, like a ventricular rhythm or something. But when you see it, you see it. Look at these like shark fin QRS complexes. All you do is go to V1. You look at um, the S wave. If it's going down, it's like a turn signal. It's a left bundle branch block. If it's going up, it's a right bundle branch block. So this is a right. Yeah, R wave, S wave. I, I always get some with, with these weird looking QRSs, the peak. Look for the big peak. And if that's going down, that's a left bundle branch block. Not always, like you need to have a wide QRS. You can't just look at any QRS and be like, oh, it's a bundle branch block. You have to have a wide QRS. Here you have, these are like really wonky looking QRSs. This is the wide QRS here, but you see it going up. So that would be a right bundle branch block. This is another one that should be a right. So wide QRSs going upwards. Yeah. Then there's all this stuff. Again, like the juice just isn't worth it. Like Wellen syndrome, whatever. Long QT. I mean, you'll learn meds and stuff that cause that, like um, like macrolides, for example. Hyperkalemia obviously is a big one. Um, 
for the peaked T waves that you see. And the thing you always hear on videos is like, it's sharp that if you fall on it, it's going to hurt. Like, it's not just like a hypertrophy T wave, but like, look at, look at these over in uh, V4 over in the anterior leads. Um, yeah, that'd be pretty sure it's off the paper. It's into the white section of the paper. It's in the margin. This is a sine wave. I actually saw this as well. Um, and we ended up doing like the full hyperkalemia protocol. We did, we did bicarb, we did albuterol, we did, and we did insulin. And then we did, we had already given calcium gluconate. So pretty, pretty cool to see like the same stuff we learned, like actually in practice. Um, hypercalcemia will have a short QT. So I think that's good to know. Hypercalcemia, you will also see Osborne J waves, which you will also see with hypothermia. So just good, like buzzword stuff, stuff to remember. Uh, the opposite hypocalcemia, you're going to have a prolonged QT hypokalemia. You're going to have these prominent U waves, which are these, you have the QRS, you have the T and then you have the U wave. Yeah. I didn't even like I didn't even get to all this when we had this exam. Digitalis, know that proxysmal atrial tachycardia is pathognomonic for that. TCAs, whatever. I mean, there's extra stuff, but like the big meat and potatoes is going to be, you know, the atrial, the junctional, the ventricular. Can you see all that? Do you know where the STEMIs are going to be? You know, pick up on the, um, on the bundle branch blocks. I totally skipped over like axis deviation. It's just not that exciting. It's like the thumb up, thumb down thing. It's not terrible. You look at what? You look at one and you look at AVF and you see like which one is more down. Lead one is upright and AVF is traveling down. So this is a left axis deviation. Right, because it's your left thumb is up. This one should be a right, yeah, because AVF is pointed more up, so it's a right access deviation. Those aren't too bad. All right, I think that's it. That's all I have. I will, all right, yeah, I will see you in the next one.